Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're through the first two modules, so we're officially halfway through the class, so congratulations on making it this far. Uh, halfway to go. So we're going to start into module three, which is going to be the Ceriscia, uh, but well, first we're going to talk about dinosaur hunters today, and then we're going to talk about some like of the more basal dinosaurs, and then we're going to walk through all these different kind of groups of the Ceriscian dinosaurs. Before we do that, though, some announcements. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, again, if you're not getting the results that you want, there's this concept of the study cycle here. Uh, everyone is probably watching the lectures, or at least I hope they are. So that would be the attend part here. Uh, there's really no way to kind of preview stuff, but you could look at the notes ahead of time. So again, I post all the PowerPoints. You could kind of skim through there, maybe take a rough skeleton of your notes before you watch and listen to the lecture. Uh, go to the lecture, which in this case is watch the lecture, listen to what I'm saying, listen to what I'm highlighting. Uh, it's a pretty dead giveaway as to what I think is important by what I emphasize and what I revisit in those questions at the beginning of each lecture. Uh, after you watch the lecture, uh, go back through and reread your notes. Is there anything missing? Are there any questions that you still have? Maybe mark in your notes with a little star or circle or something. I, I really don't understand this. Uh, and then how can you answer that? Well, office hours is a good way to come get an answer to your question. There's, again, those YouTube videos out there to kind of answer your question. The discussion board is a great place to get an answer to your question. Maybe not right away, but uh, there's a lot of people in this class. Somebody can probably help you out. Uh, I'll, pro I'll see it maybe not right away, but I'll get to it. Uh, and then the key here is to study. So uh, for a lot of people, Study means, oh crap, I've got a midterm tomorrow, I better cram for that, and I'll study for like eight hours the night before the midterm. Uh, more effective is to take those eight hours and spread it out uh, instead of one eight hour study block, which is very, I mean, it's somewhat effective for short term retention, very poor for long term retention. Instead of one eight hour block, maybe do uh, 16 half hour blocks. So like every every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, devote like an hour, something like that. That'll be a lot more effective than shoving it all at the end. Uh, and then once you've studied, uh, was your studying effective? Do you actually understand this material? Uh, try to explain it to somebody else. And if you can't, then you probably don't understand it at a level that's sufficient enough. And so go back and review some of the stuff and then start back from the beginning, loop through this. So. Um, take like a growth mindset here. There's nobody in here that can't pass this course. Uh, everybody can pass this class. Uh, one thing to do is if you're finding yourself struggling, it's very easy to blame yourself. Like, I'm just not good at this. I'm just not a science person. Uh, everybody's capable of doing this. Take a growth mindset. You can do it. Uh, the other thing is that you might start blaming the instructor. And so, uh, well, I'll admit that I'm probably not the single greatest instructor in the history of the world. Uh, these videos are probably not the greatest. The PowerPoints are probably not the greatest. There's definitely things that I could be doing better. However, it's unlikely that before the end of the semester, that's going to change all that much. Uh, I'm probably not going to improve all that much as an instructor. The format's probably not going to get all that much better. So it is what it is. This is what you have. I'm trying my best. I try every day. <laughs> I try very hard to put a lot of work into this. Uh, but if it's not working for you, uh, you really have to ask what you can do differently because you're probably not going to get the changes on the other end that you think. Remember that half the grades are still available. And again, remember that 15 credit hours in class, there's an expectation of 15 to 30 credit hours outside class. If you're not devoting that one hour for every out, one hour outside of class for one hour ever inside a class, you're probably not devoting enough time to be successful. You don't have enough time to do the study cycle, you're showing up for class, you're getting the information, and you're not re-engaging with it, you're not looking at it again, and that's a very difficult position to be in. You're not devoting enough time to do it the right way, the way that works. So uh, try to devote the time. I know people have a lot going on, but the best you can do to kind of revisit this material and get into this habit, the more successful you'll be, not only in this course, but in other courses as well. Okay, so enough. <laughs> uh, let's get into some topics on dinosaur hunting. Uh, so I don't mean like shooting dinosaurs or like 
Turok dinosaur hunter or monster hunter or things like that, but uh, looking for dinosaur bones and the people that have kind of shaped the field of paleontology over time. So we revisited this, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning of the class with the uh, what is a dinosaur lecture. Um, but the first time that a dinosaur fossil was really written and described and defined was way back in 1677 by Robert Plott, uh, the scrotum humanum, uh, obviously for the resemblance. <laughs> um, it was actually a femur. Uh, it was a very large femur. He thought maybe it was from an African war elephant or something. Clearly not anything alive in Europe at the time, in England at the time. Um, and so he didn't really know that it was a dinosaur, so I don't know if that counts or not. Uh, the first one that was really described formally as something that, wow, this is different. This is something that's definitely not alive here. This is a giant lizard, uh, was in 1824 by the Reverend William Buckland, who was an Oxford geologist. Um, so it was called, he called it Megalosaurus, which translates to big lizard because it was thought to be a really big lizard. And in many ways, it sort of is. Uh, we talked about the couple ways that dinosaurs are very distinctly different from lizards, but there are similarities. Uh, what you can see is, so this is the jawbone with like the couple teeth preserved. Uh, you see the sharp pointy teeth here indicating that it's a carnivorous uh, dinosaur. Uh, this is the change in the, how the reconstruction has been over time. So right around the time of this discovery, a little bit afterwards, this was kind of the model, this kind of slow plotting, very lizard-like animal. Right around the turn of the century, there was became a lot of evidence that these things were kind of more upright and more active. Uh, you see the kind of tail drag here, though, still kind of remnants of that. Uh, okay, it's a lizard, but it stands upright. It's but it's still essentially a lizard, still kind of slow and plodding and dragging the tail on the ground. Uh, and now this is kind of the more modern view uh, of dinosaurs, and in many ways this is even a little bit outdated, but kind of very active, bipedal. Uh, many, most of them are bipedal anyways. We'll talk about all the different clads later. But uh, for this particular, Megalosaurus itself went from this plodding bi uh, quadrupedal, slow, bulky lizard to this very agile bipedal predator. And this is probably a lot closer to the truth here, or at least that's where we've headed towards over time. Uh, so Megalosaurus was one of the first in England, but certainly wasn't the last. Uh, Gideon Mantell is credited with discovering the Iguanodon, uh, but it was actually his wife, Marianne, and they discovered it in 1822, but they described it a little bit later. Uh, Iguanodon literally translates to iguana tooth uh, because the teeth were kind of that leaf-like appearance that modern iguanas have. Iguana teeth are kind of very weird. Uh, the big thing about this find was that uh, those teeth indicate that this wasn't a carnivore, like Megalosaurus was, it was an herbivore, which uh, there are no living giant, uh, or I should say large herbivorous lizards. There's nothing like that in the modern world. And so in many ways, this Iguanodon was even more interesting than Megalodon. Not only was it a very large, uh, likely extinct reptile, but it was also a very large herbivorous extinct reptile. And so this was very different from how it was. And again, you kind of see that over time, as the interpretations have changed, the reconstructions of this specimen have changed as well. Uh, this is the first early sketch here in the manuscript where it was described. And the drawing was actually done by Marianne. So Marianne actually did the scientific drawing. Uh, you'll notice the little horn here on the nose. Uh, when this dinosaur was found with all these different bones, it's disarticulated and you have to kind of put it together. Uh, the horn was later discovered that it's actually the thumb spike, uh, but it's a perfectly reasonable reconstruction for the data that they had at the time was to put it on the nose there. Uh, and you see that that nose spike kind of kept through like a couple decades. Uh, and then again, kind of this switch to still very lizard-like, very bulky, very slow looking, but more upright. And then kind of evolving into a little bit more agile Although this is a pretty, still a pretty bulky herbivore, so not like the dynamic, like the megalosaur carnivore. Uh, but you see this change over time, kind of moving away from that 
initial lizard-like interpretation to more of a dynamic interpretation as we talked about with like the warm-blooded discussion and the feathers discussion and things like that. Uh, and then the last one that was kind of described around this time is the Hyliosaurus. Uh, again, it was the Mantells that discovered this, a partial skeleton. Here's a draft figure of that. And what's cool about this one, so we had a carnivorous reptile, we had an herbivorous reptile. This is a very armored dinosaur. Uh, Hyliosaurus translates to lizard of the wood, uh, named after the forest where it was found. Uh, initially, you see that these plates, these kind of pointy projections, were reconstructed as kind of like a back frill. Uh, and now they are more of like a side ornamentation with some, some back frills here on the tail. But again, you see this like depictions over time moving from like the scale up a big lizard, put some back spikes on it, and you've got a Hyliosaur to, okay, maybe it's a lot more dinosaur like. This one happens to be quadrupedal. But you see that it's a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more agile, a little bit uh, more upright, a little bit more erect, a little bit more mobile, uh, and maybe even a little bit more armored and more formidable. So you kind of see this shift over time. Again, as we get more information, the reconstructions change. All paleo art is a hypothesis. It's a attempt to do your best effort to reconstruct the organism as it was in life, to put flesh back on the bones but throughout the last couple of weeks, we've seen all those different limitations. The soft parts aren't preserved. The feathers are not preserved if they're there. The hair is very unlikely to be preserved. All of these don't have hair, but um, soft parts, mus muscles, organs, all that's not preserved, or I should say very rarely preserved. And it makes it complicated. And so these descriptions are going to change with time and they'll continue to change with time. Um, so these things were discovered, uh, but they weren't really called dinosaurs yet. The first one to use the term dinosaur was Sir Richard Owen. He coined the term dinosauria in 1841. So that was kind of the invention of dinosaurs. So uh, here's a paragraph from the book here. Combination of such characters, some as the sacral ones. So we talked about sacral vertebrae. Uh, particu peculiar among reptiles, other borrowed uh, largest of extinct uh, existing reptiles, it's presumed to be sufficient grounds for establishing a distinct tribe or suborder of saurian reptiles for, I which, uh, for which I would propose the name Dinosauria. So this was the first use of Dinosauria, and you see it goes on to include Megalosaurus, Hyliosaurus, and Iguanodon. So those were the first kind of three that got lumped into the dinosaurs. Uh, he didn't make those discoveries, but he did lump them together under this new tribe of Dinosauria. Uh, unfortunately, Sir Richard Owen, his uh, reputation is pretty problematic. He was pretty kind of awful in many ways, uh, but uh, nevertheless, there was this contribution of he's the one that named dinosaurs, the, the horrifyingly large, terrifyingly large lizards, the dinosaurs. Uh, and so this is 1840s. If we progress into the 1850s, uh, a precursor to the World's Fair called the Great Exhibition in 1851. Uh, they built this really fancy crystal palace to kind of show off some of the like cultural and uh, indus industrial exhibits that they had. Uh, they had the show and then they moved the palace to South London a couple of years later. And when they moved it, they wanted a little bit of centerpiece stuff for the gardens around there. So they commissioned some sculptures of some of these dinosaurs, these uh, the Iguanodon and the Megalosaur and the Hyliosaur, <clears throat> uh, some other extinct animals too. They weren't all dinosaurs, some just ancient life. Uh, and you can see here in the cartoon, uh, a visit to the antediluvian reptiles at Sindham. Uh, Master Tom strongly objects to having his mind improved, so the child's not having a lot of fun, but you see that antediluvian, so like the before flood uh, reptiles, so still that kind of biblical flood uh, concept kind of being carried in here. So the idea that these things were around and prominent and then the great flood came. So Noah's Ark and all that stuff, these things were eliminated uh, and then were in the kind of after flood. So those ideas were around there. Again, the ideas of that lizard-like body form, lizard-like ad adaptations. So again, these things changed through time. Uh, so this is kind of the story in England in the 1850s. 
uh, if we go across the pond uh, to North America. So uh, again, a discovery of some teeth and bones uh, out in like west, out west in like what's now Montana, uh, Joseph Lighty uh, discovered a relatively complete hadrosaur in New Jersey. So uh, when we think about dinosaurs, we often think about like uh, well, you, uh, areas out west, but uh, some of the first big North American discoveries were on the East Coast, this particularly in like New Jersey in that area. Um, so this is his reconstruction of Hadrosaurus, which translates to heavy lizard. Uh, again, you can see kind of they there was evidence on this fossil that it was bipedal. You see the reduced front limbs to the hind limbs. And so uh, he made the interpretation that this wouldn't be a quadrupedal animal, that it must be standing upright. Uh, you see that it's standing very upright. And that kind of conception sort of lingered for a while. Uh, this is kind of the more modern version where it's uh, it can be upright, but it's kind of like it can also be quadrupedal, kind of like uh, interim between the two. Um, but since it was so similar to Iguanodon with the kind of smaller front limbs, uh, was Iguanodon maybe bipedal too? And so this was the real start of that change from that lizard-like quadrupedal slow and plodding starting to become kind of more upright, uh, less lizard-like, and more what we think about dinosaurs today. Uh, and so this, uh, so Joseph Leidy, uh, Edward Drinker Cope was a student of Joseph Leidy. Uh, he described another fossil in New Jersey in 1866, and he noticed that a lot of similarities between it and Megalosaurus, so it was this large uh, carnivorous reptile, it also seemed to be bipedal, and he called it Lelaps uh, after there's this mythological foxhound in Greek mythology that was like a gift and it eventually made its way to like King Minos or something, but the fox never failed to, or the hound never failed to catch the fox in its hunts, so it was like undefeated, so uh, this was a very prominent carnivore, and so they named it Lelaps in honor of that, that you know, this thing would never miss its quarry. It's a very ferocious, fierce predator. Uh, but it turns out that that name was already in use for a mite. So in paleontology, there's this concept of priority. So whatever name gets used first takes precedent, whether we like the name or not. <laughs> uh, the name that was used first takes precedent. And so this Laylapse was an invalid name because it was already in use. And so Othniel Charles Marsh kind of swooped in and he renamed it uh, Dryptosaurus, uh, translates to wounding reptile. Then you can see why it had these kind of sharp pointy claws, uh, very clearly a highly advanced uh, carnivorous predatory dinosaur with these very, very dangerous claws. And so this is really starting to cement that shift from, okay, well, you know, these are big, slow, plodding dinosaurs to now we've got in paleo art, this is right around the turn of the century, a very famous painting called Leaping Laylaps, uh, using the older name uh, by Charles Knight in 1897 here. And you see again, like this is pretty close to the modern representation of how these things would have behaved, very active, very dynamic very bipedal. Uh, and so you see that, but uh, this was kind of the seeds, this like um, Edward Drinker Cope named the dinosaur and kind of Marsh swooped in and changed the name uh, because of that priority. And so this kind of kicked off this big feud that would define North American paleontology for the next like three decades plus. And so it's often called the Bone Wars. So during the 70s and 80s, uh, Cope and Marsh were just kind of all over the American West, kind of competing with each other, seeing who could discover the most dinosaur fossils, who could name the most species, who could describe the most fossils. Uh, they were also working with some mammal stuff, but it was mostly dinosaurs. Uh, the Bone Wars was a very unfortunate chapter in paleontology. Uh, there were a lot of very shady tactics, so there were a lot of personal attacks in print trying to kind of diminish each other and ruin their credibility. Uh, there was a lot of bribery going around, so Marsh actually bribed 
some people from a quarry to funnel the finds to him instead of to cope. And there was theft of specimens. Uh, there was even allegedly destruction of specimens, which maybe turns out to not be true, but there was a story of somebody kind of dynamiting a quarry and just kind of blowing up the whole thing rather than let it fall into the hands of the opposition. Uh, it turns out that it looks like it was actually just filled in, but something like this would not have been entirely out of place during this feud. Uh, so you see here kind of, this was a board game based on it. Uh, there's books based on it. This is a very good book that kind of walks through the whole history of it. Uh, a lot of very shady, backhanded, just massively personal and pointed attacks. And so again, we've talked about this a little bit where scientists often like to kind of say that science is objective and fact-based and emotions don't get involved and opinions don't get involved and feelings don't get involved. But ultimately at the end of the day, Science is a process that is conducted by people, flawed people, uh, in this case, probably very flawed people. And so they were trying to objectively do the science, but their feelings and their emotions and their egos got in the way. And this is not uncommon, unfortunately. Uh, over time, the process has like self-correcting mechanisms built in that eventually the objective truth will win out just based on the abundance of fact. But in a lot of ways, this kind of stuff gets in the way and really kind of slows down progress. Uh, it usually can't reverse progress because um, you know the objective truth eventually wins, but uh, it's definitely difficult. It's a difficult process handled difficultly <laughs> by difficult people. And so it's not always the smooth linear progression towards the best idea. There's fits and starts and there can be setbacks. And so just remember that. Um, but uh, as an end result of the Bone Wars, there was a lot of massive number of discoveries out west. So Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, Apatosaurus, Triceratops, Coelophysis, and just many, many more of the very famous one brand names that everyone kind of instantly recognizes whether they're taking a dinosaur's class or not, uh, these are dinosaurs that everybody knows. If you go talk to your parents about Stegosaurus, uh, they're gonna probably have heard of Stegosaurus. People know Stegosaurus. Uh, maybe to a lesser extent, people know Allosaurus. Uh, Triceratops, definitely another big hitter that most people know. Uh, these dinosaurs were all discovered during this just crazy feud between these two massive egos. Uh, one of the kind of funnier examples during this is that uh, in their attempts to really kind of outdo each other, uh, they were kind of churning out uh, scientific papers, trying to churn out fossil reconstructions as fast as they possibly could. So remember, there was that thing with the junior synonym, whatever was published first, whoever published first, whoever described the specimen first, whoever got there first in the literature and got it published in an article first, uh, they got to name it and they got credit. If the other person published a month later, uh, it became a junior synonym and the old name was used instead. And so they were really in a race to see who could name the most stuff and who could describe the most stuff. And it resulted in a lot of kind of shoddy haphazard work, uh, a lot of confusion, maybe some misconceptions that lingered for, in some cases, decades. So again, this is an example of two very prominent people in the scientific community, and they're kind of butting heads with each other. And although they are contributing massively to the field, uh, eventually they sort of become impediments and become a hindrance to the advancement and the progress. And remember, there was that saying, uh, progress happens one retirement at a time or one funeral at a time. Uh, this is definitely an example of this where uh, they definitely had a lot of massive contributions during their lifetime, but the feud really got in the way and a lot of stuff that was in addition to all of the positives, there was a lot of negatives that came out as well. Uh, the probably most famous example is that Cope, when he was reconstructing uh, this elasmosaur, so this uh, plesiosaur, uh, he put the skull on the wrong end. So this was his reconstruction here 
Uh, you put the skull on here, it makes sense. Uh, you wouldn't think that an animal would have a neck longer than its tail, it's kind of weird. Uh, but on closer inspection, uh, the head actually does belong over here. This is a very oddly elongated neck, which we see in a lot of the plesiosaurs. Uh, so the skull actually belonged over here. Uh, the famous story is that uh, Marsh was the one that called him out on it. And so it kind of added to the feud, uh, although it looks like that's not actually true. It looks like it was actually Lighty, uh, the kind of older mentor that kind of pointed out officially in literature. Uh, but Marsh did kind of try to take credit for um, for pointing this out and kind of making a laughing stock of his colleague. And obviously this contributed to even furthering the feud. Uh, but you see like, again, this was kind of the early reconstruction of this animal. Again, kind of the, the noodle neck waving around uh, versus a more modern interpretation with this very sturdy, very well muscled neck that can probably only really move up and down and doesn't really move side to side that wouldn't help you when you're swimming, a good way to break your neck, which is obviously not ideal. So this is just one example of the way that things went terribly wrong during this feud. Uh, so what ended up kind of happening, what was the final score? Uh, when all was said and done, uh, they had both exhausted their personal fortune. So they were using their own money to fund all these expeditions and to pay all the bribes <laughs> and all the workers that they were paying to dig up these fossils. Uh, by the end of it, they were both, both financially and professionally ruined by this feud. So uh, who won the bone wars? Uh, really, they both lost. Uh, in addition, the reputation of North American paleontology was a loser as well. So Europeans sort of were looking down their noses at North American paleontologists as a result of this like just very public, very bitter, very petty feud between these two big personalities. Uh, Lighty was somewhat involved, but he kind of got sick of the interpersonal and sort of withdrew from the feud. And so even though he himself had a lot of major contributions, uh, he's often very poorly recognized for his contributions just because he's kind of overshadowed by all the other stuff that's going on. But if we want to look at scoreboard, uh, there were 136 new species discovered during the Bone Wars. And of that, Marsh had 80 and Cope had 56. So I guess you could say Marsh won, but really in the end, nobody won. There was a lot of science that was advanced, a lot of positive contributions, but at the expense of some very negative consequences and some very, uh, you know, careers were destroyed and people were harmed and stressed and uh, just not a good situation for anybody. Uh, but we wouldn't be where we are in paleontology without it. So uh, we're going to talk on the next few slides about some more baggage uh, of all of the disciplines. Paleontology has a very fraught record of how it came to be. There's a lot of ways that it was handled very poorly and we still deal with those lingering impacts to this day. Uh, so one good example of this is uh, the expedition to Tendaguru, which is a uh, formation in modern day Tanzania. So uh, this is an example of the age of imperialism. So uh, imperialism started kind of trickling into paleontology and it really started taking over. So uh, in 1907 to 1912, uh, Berlin's main museum of nature uh, funded these expeditions to Tanzania, which at the time was a German colony. Uh, and in the process, they gathered up 225 tons of fossils. They were recovered in the country and they were transported back to Berlin to study. Uh, what you'll notice from this picture here uh, this is a pretty good example of how the labor was differentiated. So the locals were very much doing the hard backbreaking label, labor of extracting and moving and really packaging these things up for shipment. And the, the Germans in the expedition were the ones that were ultimately kind of leading it and sort of doing more of the scientific kind of quote unquote skilled labor, although it does require a lot of skill 
to dig these fossils without damaging them and properly package them for shipping. Uh, that was the division of labor. And so at the end of the day, the Germans came in with the skills and the knowledge of the paleontology, paleontology and biology. Uh, they came in, they uh, the, used the locals as labor. Uh, they didn't pass the scientific skills on, so the locals didn't benefit from the expertise that was around there. Uh, they also didn't get to keep the specimens that were in their own territory. And so this 225 tons of Tanzanian natural history that was obviously very unique and very important, uh, it's not in Tanzania. The expertise wasn't built in Tanzania. Uh, all of it was exported to Germany where it was stored in Berlin and eventually on display in Berlin. So this is uh, the, I think it's still the largest mounted specimen in the world. Uh, this giraffe titan, uh, formerly known as Brachiosaurus. Again, junior synonym, giraffe titan was named first. Brachiosaurus was named later, so Brachiosaurus is out. Um, but this is on display in Germany. It was dug up in Tanzania by Tanzanians, and they were not trained and they didn't, there were no Tanzanian paleontologists trained as a result of this. And so it was really just uh, colonial power coming in and really just stripping of natural resources. Uh, we see this a lot with other geological uh, disciplines. So like resource extraction, mineral extraction, oil and gas, diamonds. This is a trend that we see repeated throughout this time period where uh, kind of parachute in, exploit the natural resources, don't develop skills in the native population and just kind of go away and study it back in the home country. And so obviously this ripples throughout time and these effects cascade through time and they lead to a lot of the inequalities that we see today. Uh, another expedition to Egypt. So Ernst Stromer, again, a German went into Egypt uh, and found the first dinosaur bones recognized there in Egypt. Uh, again, continuing this pattern, the materials were shipped back to Germany for study. And so again, it was dug up in Egypt by Egyptian labor. Uh, no Egyptians were trained to work with the fossils. They were not trained in the skilled labor. Uh, and all of everything was transported back to Germany where it would be studied by German scientists. Uh, the most important finding that they had was uh, Spinosaurus aegypticus, which uh, everybody's probably familiar with Spinosaurus, very famous from the Jurassic Park franchise, uh, sticks out for this very prominent sail on its back. Uh, we're going to be talking about Spinosaurus in the coming weeks. Uh, there's a kind of raging debate about whether Spinosaurus was kind of fully to mostly aquatic, where it spent a lot of time acti actively swimming in the water. Uh, Spinosaurus would be like the only genre of highly aquatic dinosaurs. Uh, all of the other dinosaurs are terrestrial and would only occasionally dabble in the water. Uh, there's rending, renderings that have Spinosaurus like highly developed to an aquatic, a fully aquatic lifestyle, sometimes even drawn with webbed feet and things using this sail as kind of like a rudder uh, versus was it more of like a kind of water side predator kind of capturing fish from the shoreline, very similar to like a modern heron or something. Uh, and it's been kind of going back and forth. Uh, as recently as like two years ago, it was like definitively that it was an aquatic predator. And just this year, there was another paper, I should say just last year, there was another paper that kind of swung the pendulum back the other way. Uh, we'll talk all about this debate when we get to Spinosaurus, but just keep that in mind. But uh, this is the original reconstruction. Again, you can see the very upright stance, the two upright stance with the center of gravity kind of like really high in the body here. And then again, the tail drag, that lizard-like tail drag. Uh, there were some other specimens that were covered uh, during this. So there's this big sauropod bone here. Uh, some of these fossils are now on display in Egypt. So uh, some of the natural history was recovered and retained. Uh, not all of it was exported. But again, another example of uh, countries' natural resource wealth 
sort of being funneled away to somewhere else and being stripped and having very little advantage for the home country. And so obviously that's a bit unfair and leads to inequities. Uh, another expedition, uh, Central Asiatic expedition uh, in the 1920s uh, to the Flaming Cliffs in Mongolia. Uh, so far, the examples have been Germans. Uh, in this case, it's an American. So Roy Chapman Andrews for the American Museum of Natural History uh, had an expedition to, again, Mongolia here. Uh, it was pretty unique because they were actually trying to use cars. So uh, our American obsession with cars goes all the way back to the beginning. Uh, apparently worked fairly well. Uh, they also used a, a lot of camels. So this was just a massive project, a series of expeditions uh, in a very hostile environment. So it was one of the hottest and driest places on earth. It also gets pretty cold in the night and in the winter. And so incredibly harsh terrain, incredibly harsh climates. Uh, trying to deal with like early cars, only knows how they kept those running. Uh, I can kind of imagine how they kept the camels running. They're adapted for this environment. Um, but some of their biggest discoveries was uh, protoceratops. So kind of a more basal ceratopsian, uh, earlier ancestor to triceratops and some of the better known uh, horn frilled dinosaurs. Uh, they also found numerous intact dinosaur eggs and nests. Mongolia is very famous for dinosaur eggs and nests, uh, including that fossil of oviraptor, which we saw earlier with the arms kind of wrapped around the eggs, where originally it was the egg thief uh, in thinking that it was stealing protoceratops' eggs. But in reality, all the eggs were oviraptor eggs and that was protecting the eggs. Uh, that was a find that was in Mongolia as a result of this expedition. Uh, and again, the material was all shipped back to New York for study. So it was loaded up onto these cars, transported through the desert and shipped out of the country. The material was removed from the country. The expertise was removed from the country. Uh, everything left the country and went back to New York for study. And, and so again, Roy Chapman Clark and American scientists worked on this Mongolian material. Uh, one would hope that this sort of exploitation remained in the past uh, however, there are some very recent examples. So just last year in 2020, there was a paper published on a Brazilian fossil find. So uh, in 1995, uh, German workers uncovered material in a quarry. Uh, and it was just described this past year as Uber Rajara, the quote unquote, it translates to Lord of Spikes, because it has these very prominent shoulder spikes and also has this really cool kind of almost furry looking tail with those kind of filamentous proto feathers. Uh, however, uh, Brazilian law, uh, in recognition of this fact, this, his, this past controversy of all this uh, colonialism infiltrating into paleontology and these uh, differences in how the labor was divided and how the fossil material was divided, uh, Brazil made laws that prohibited the export of fossils so fossils that were found in Brazil had to stay in Brazil and that the studies of those fossils had to involve at least one Brazilian scientist. And so this is a way that the country is able to maintain its natural history. And it's also able to benefit from that natural history by building local expertise in the fossils themselves. So not only are you contributing to the field of paleontology, you're also building up the next generation of local paleontologists. And so the material stays in the country, the expertise stays in the country, and the home country benefits from these natural resources that it had inside there, which that seems like the fair way to do it, at least in my opinion. Um, so now there's this big push to bring the fossil back to Brazil. Uh, it never should have left in the first place. Uh, allegedly, there were permits in place in 1995 uh, I'm not haven't followed it very closely, but last I knew the paper trail on that was somewhat suspect. So uh, there's been an effort to repatriate the fossil and bring it back to Brazil, where it would then be studied further by Brazilian scientists in Brazil as a Brazilian fossil. Seems reasonable, seems fair. Uh, back to the Americas. So in, this brings us up to like the 1960s. So a little bit of a gap here from the 1920s to the kind of mid 1900s. Why? Well, 
World War, Great Depression, Second World War. Uh, people were still working in dinosaurs, but it obviously there wasn't a lot of attention paid to it. There weren't a lot of advances, so it kind of stagnated. Uh, a lot of fields kind of stagnated during these years because there just wasn't a lot of resources devoted to it. There wasn't a lot of labor available. Uh, focus and attention were elsewhere. Uh, but in the 1960s, after that kind of passed over, uh, John Ostrom at Yale and many of his students were kind of highly active out in the Western US. Uh, one of the main contributions here was that they discovered that hadrosaurs, the duck-billed dinosaurs, uh, had a very efficient chewing strategy that was actually more efficient than a lot of modern herbivores uh, and saw that this was also true in ceratopsians and other herbivorous dinosaurs, that dinosaurs, herbivorous dinosaurs were very efficient at chewing and digesting plant material. And that was helped to sustain their very large uh, body sizes. Uh, also that this team discovered the first true raptor. So uh, Deinonychus uh, translates to uh, terrible claws and you can kind of see why. So like if you think the Jurassic Park, the Velociraptor is with the claws, you know, the click, click, click on the thing. Uh, it also kind of revived, uh, they also kind of revived this idea that had kind of been around even from the very beginning that there was maybe a link to birds and dinosaurs ancestrally. And this was kind of some first kind of hard evidence or a lot of structural similarities between these small raptors, these small clawed raptors and the modern bird raptors, which are loosely related to each other. Uh, and again, a lot of the concepts that we recently discussed in class last week, so like <coughs> whether, whether dinosaurs were warm-blooded or mesothermic, uh, whether how much feathers they had, what kind of feathers they had, how, how much feather coverage they had, uh, whether they were like dynamic and active or kind of slow plodding lizards, uh, all of these concepts were really kind of starting to come around in like the 1960s. Uh, and then in 1986, uh, Robert Baker published his book, The Dinosaur Heresies. And that really kind of advanced these theories of the warm blooded active dinosaur. And this is, it really started kind of guiding and putting in place the seeds of, you know, what we conceptualize dinosaurs to be today. And we continue to kind of swing that pendulum in the other direction now where dinosaurs are active predators, uh, or so I should say active animals with like mesothermic to perhaps even endothermic, uh, not, not cold, not cold-blooded, slow plodding lizards. Uh, and after he wrote this book, uh, he served together with Jack Horner, another very famous American paleontologist. Uh, they served as scientific advisors on the original Jurassic Park in 1993. Uh, so this, you know, Jurassic Park at the time, uh, it really kind of captured the public's imagination. Like it, it led to like dinomania, uh, even people that never really cared about dinosaurs before. It was kind of so cool to see them on the big screen. And obviously uh, there was a lot of artistic license taken to increase the drama and make them look a little bit scarier, like the roar of the T-Rex, uh, the pack leader communication of the Velociraptors, the scaled up size of the Velociraptors, uh, Dilophosaurus spitting venom, uh, all of those were kind of like scientific liberties that were taken to boost the dramatic impact. Um, so there were a lot of things that were quote unquote wrong about Jurassic Park, but the one thing that it definitely got right is it inspired people. Uh, dinosaurs were cool. It was neat to see these things alive and around. And a lot of people came to love dinosaurs and be interested in dinosaurs because of the Jurassic Park franchise. Uh, a lot of you are probably taking this class because of Jurassic Park. Uh, I'm teaching this class at least partially because of Jurassic Park. I, I think dinosaurs are cool enough to teach a class about because I loved Jurassic Park when it came out. I was a teenager. I was like, yeah, dinosaurs are freaking cool. Uh, a lot of things that people still perceive about dinosaurs though, like for example, T-Rex's like bad vision in the movie, uh, that's not a thing. So it's still a lot of these misconceptions kind of linger from that. Uh, but overall, I think it's been a positive for the paleontology community. It, it, you know, paleontology, the study of these old dry bones uh, can be a little bit boring. 
<laughs> Sorry, but true. Um, so this kind of made it more exciting. It put the flesh on the bones. It made these things living and alive and you could see what they're doing and how they're behaving and how they're interacting. And it made it more exciting for people. It made it more real for people. Uh, and the general public kind of fell in love with dinosaurs. And so this was kind of a logical continuation of this dinosaurs heresies where we really start seeing the modern perception of dinosaurs, the modern vision of dinosaurs that Jurassic Park does a pretty good job of capturing uh, <laughs> with some flaws. Um, so that brings us to today. Uh, so as you've seen throughout the course, the story of dinosaurs, what they are, what they look like, how they behave is always changing. It's always evolving. How we draw the dinosaur cladogram that actually illustrates dinosaur evolution is evolving. So the evolution of dinosaurs is evolving. And we've already seen this slide before earlier in the course, but just again to hammer home this point, uh, science is not all the knowledge of humanity. When you say that science is or was wrong, yeah, it definitely was. So like science, science would, isn't really true, but science said the earth was flat. Uh, that wasn't really scientists per se, um, but that was a common thing that people believed. The process of science proved that that was wrong with new evidence and new data. And so that's been rejected or at least mostly rejected. It still is very sticky in, in the non-scientific community. Uh, but science is not all knowledge of humanity. If it was, all of the examples of where we're wrong would prove that science doesn't work. Uh, science is the process. So science is the process by which we make hypotheses. We make guesses about how something works or what a dinosaur was like. We look at all the available data and if it fits the data, we can keep it. And if it doesn't, we throw it out. And then it, we replace it with something new and in theory better that fits the data more. And as we've seen before, there's also the personalities, there's the emotions, there's the hubris, there's the egos that get in the way. But ultimately at the end of the day, eventually the objective truth wins out and we get towards a better answer. But what was the truth? Uh, we don't have the luxury of a time machine. We don't, we'll never know for sure exactly what dinosaurs were like. So this, this science is a process of getting closer to a better truth, a better approximation of what was actually happening. And for better or worse, it's never going to be finished. Science is never done. We're always gonna have things that we can know better than we do now. Every question that we answer, often you, it creates two more questions that need to be answered. The more you know about the topic, the more it becomes obvious that you don't know, the more doors it opens up. And we just kind of keep improving over time for better or worse. Uh, our current knowledge, uh, especially in this arena with dinosaurs, uh, our current knowledge may be flawed. A lot of the information that I'm telling you in the course that represents our current best knowledge, uh, a lot of that's probably wrong, but the process of science isn't because the stuff that I'm telling you now that may in fact be wrong, uh, a decade from now or two decades from now will be replaced with better information just like we've seen this process from the slow plodding lizards to the more modern representation. Uh, maybe the pendulum starts swinging back the other way, but uh, this is the progress. And so if we look at by research year uh, back in the early days, when we're talking about those European dinosaurs, those three species dinosaurs are named here, the total number of dinosaurs known, again, there's kind of a stagnation here during the war period, uh, and then really in the 80s, it really starts taking off uh, the rate of dinosaur discoveries. Uh, this, what we're in now is really kind of the golden age of dinosaur science. There's more dinosaurs being named now than ever before. There's more people with more expertise on more continents, a much more diverse team of global scientists working in their own backyards on fossil discoveries in their own home countries uh, with expertise from other countries as well thrown in these kind of multinational teams working on multinational problems, uh, trying to get past this history of, you know, not so great examples in paleontology, geology, and a lot of other fields. Uh, so that's all I got for today.
I uh, hope you enjoyed that, and goodbye.